The NCAA Women's March Madness Tournament is all about intensity on the court. It's a mental fortitude exercise. And yeah, it's a little bit about luck as well. And for 40 minutes and sometimes more, players and coaches have to clear their mind of everything except basketball and get the job done on the court. But for two teams, there were, there were more weighing on them during this year's NCAA tournament. Allegations of racism. Now we begin with Utah women's basketball during their press conference after losing to Gonzaga in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Coach Lynn Roberts answered a question about why the team changed hotels shortly after arriving to the tournament in Idaho. Here is what was said. Lynn, non-game specific, but I understand that you guys had to move hotels uh, this week based on an incident. Can you maybe expound on what happened or, or kind of what the situation was? Uh, yeah. Uh, when, so we, you know, the, the Gonzaga is the host in Spokane, but our team hotel was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, which is not very close. 35, 40 minutes. Um, so that was a little strange, but whatever. Uh, and, you know, we had uh, several instances of um, some kind of racial uh, hate crimes uh, towards our program and uh, incredibly upsetting for all of us. Uh, and, you know, you think... In, in our worlds, uh, the, you know, in athletics and, and in university settings, it's shocking, um, you know, in a non, it, it, like there's so much diversity in, in, in a, on a college campus. And so you're just not exposed to that very often. And so when you are, it's like, uh, you know, and you, you have people say, man, I can't believe that happened. but. Uh, you know, racism is real and it happens and it's, uh, it's awful. And so for our players, whether they are, um, you know, white, black, green, whatever, no one knew how to handle it, you know? Um, and it was really upsetting. And for our players and, and, staff to not feel safe in an NCAA tournament environment, um, it's messed up. And so we uh, moved hotels and, you know, the NCAA and, and Gonzaga worked to get us in a new hotel and we appreciate that. Um, but yeah, that's what happened and it was a distraction and upsetting and um, unfortunate, you know, uh, th this should be a positive for everybody involved. This should be a joyous time for our program. And to have kind of a black eye on that experience is unfortunate. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what happened. When did the, when did, like what days did they happen and when did you move hotels? Uh, yes, happened in Coeur d'Alene. Um, we, we flew up Thursday, so it happened Thursday night a few times and then we left Friday. So it, it was really unfortunate and disappointing and upsetting and all the things uh, when this experience shouldn't be any of those things. So, um, you know, the, the shock of like, wow, I can't believe that happened. Yeah, I think it happens a lot and, and it doesn't get talked about enough. So if you are wondering why was the team placed in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, when the game actually took place in Spokane, Washington, well, it is because Spokane, Washington, where Gonzaga plays, was also a predetermined site for the first two rounds of the men's NCAA March Madness tournament. Uh, space was limited because of all the, the players and coaches and, and uh, support staff and bands and cheerleaders and all that stuff uh, because there's a lot of support that comes with uh, teams playing in the tournament um, there was a lot of hotel space that was needed and there wasn't enough space to put, um, all of the men's teams and all of the women's teams in Spokane, Washington hotels. So Utah and UC Irvine stayed in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And from what I understand, South Dakota state, which was also there 
for the women's tournament, uh, they stayed in Washington. So, so for the women's side, it was um, it was Gonzaga who was already at home, so they didn't stay anywhere. Um, it was Gonzaga, it was Utah, it was UC Irvine, and it was South Dakota State who all participated in games for the first round and the second round. All right, so even though UC Irvine and Utah was pretty far from Spokane, um, in Quarter Lane, that's about 35 minutes or so, uh, Gonzaga, the host school, did arrange for police escorts from the hotel to the venue to ensure that teams did not have to encounter traffic and were able to get to the venue as fast as possible. Shortly after this incident occurred and some of the men's teams were eliminated, hotel space opened up in Spokane and Utah and UC Irvine were offered the chance to move hotels. Now, a thing to note is that I have not seen any reports of UC Irvine players experiencing a racial incident, uh, but after hearing about what happened to Utah, they decided to move hotels as well. All right, now on to the incident. According to KSL.com, the youth women's basketball team, their band, their cheerleading team, as well as support staff were going from their hotel to a local restaurant in Quarter Lane. And as they were walking to the restaurant, a white truck appeared near them, revved its engine, and one of the occupants of the truck yelled the N-word before leaving. Shamel Green, who is Utah's deputy athletics director, uh, who was actually with the team at the time, said about this incident, we were all in shock. And we looked at each other like, did we just hear that? Everybody was in shock. Our cheerleaders, our students that were in the area that heard it uh, clearly were just frozen. She said, we kept walking, just shaking our heads like, I can't believe that. Now, a little bit after, after the team arrived at the restaurant, they ate. And when they were leaving about two hours later, uh, they left out and they saw two trucks revving their engine while yelling the N-word. And Charmel said, I went back to the hotel and just had some time alone. Uh, she also did uh, reach out to Mark Harlan, who is the athletic director for Utah. Um, Charmel also said, I was just numb the entire night. The Utes also did reach out to law enforcement, uh, a little bit more on that later. Uh, but in terms of her responses, Gonzaga put out a statement yesterday on X saying, Gonzaga University has been made aware of the racially disparaging comments made to visiting student, student athletes and travel party members in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, in advance of the NCAA women's first and second round basketball tournament games this, these past several days. Hate speech in any form is repugnant, shameful, and must never be tolerated. We worked hard to secure the opportunity to serve as the host institution, and our first priority is and must be the safety and welfare of all student athletes, coaches, families, and support staff. To this end, we have closely worked with uh, the NCAA and program participants to support the security and safety of everyone involved. We are, are frustrated and deeply saddened to know that what should have been an amazing visitor and championship experience was in any way compromised by the situation. For it in no way reflects the values, standards, and beliefs to which we at Gonzaga University hold ourselves accountable. And after that, the NCAA released a statement as well saying NCAA championship events represent the pinnacle of a student athlete's collegiate career. We are devastated about the Utah team's experience while traveling to compete on what should have been a weekend competing on the brightest stage and creating some of the fondest memories of their lives. We extend our thanks to the leadership at Gonzaga, Utah, and everyone for in acting quickly to address the situation and to law enforcement for its quick response and efforts to keep student athletes safe. Now for Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, the city has launched an investigation into the matter and are trying to find the people involved. There was a press conference held yesterday in Coeur d'Alene where the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations had this to say. On behalf of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations, we have prepared the following formal statement. Last week, two women's basketball teams participating in the regional NCA a women's tournament in Spokane were staying at the Coeur d'Alene Resort in our beautiful city. On Thursday, March the 21st, two teams were walking to dinner 
at a local restaurant here in Coeur d'Alene when they were encountered by a truck displaying a Confederate flag as the driver began spewing appalling racial slurs at them, also using the N-word. As the players left the restaurant after dinner, the same perpetrator, now reinforced by others, began again these racist rants toward these innocent victims. Following the women back to the Coeur d'Alene Resort, continuing the racial slurs while revving their engines, which we believe was a serious threat to the safety of those students. The players were so traumatized by um, the, this encounter that they had, and they got back to the hotel, they told the coaches and staff. And on Friday, some of them left from Spokane, the others left on Saturday when hotel rooms were available in that city. I want to make it very clear and very loud that we condemn the strongest, in the strongest terms those horrendous acts of hatred, and if the perpetrators can be found, we call upon them to be prosecuted. There is no place in our communities or in the United States of America for such horrific acts. These acts of hate are in counter to everything that we believe in and the values of Idahoans and the dignity for all persons. Although we have made progress in race relations in our country over the last few decades, particularly with federal laws and state laws, prejudice and hatred is still with us. Racism, as well as many other forms of bigotry, are still very much alive in the United States and around the world. Although free expression under the U.S. Constitution protects an individual displaying a Confederate flag on his or her vehicle, even though that is protected, the Confederate symbol sends a message to the minorities in our country that they are not welcome, especially in our beautiful city. And it does not permit the perpetrators to engage in verbal threats toward any person or group. The line has been crossed. There is clear evidence that such a toxic environment often leads to violence as we witnessed during the Aryan Nations period in Northern Idaho. When individuals engage in such behavior and language and racist words, they cannot excuse themselves if and when other individuals influenced by those words engage in violence. After the bombings in Coeur d'Alene in the 1980s by associates of the Aryan Nations, we were reminded what Governor John Evans said when he spoke at North Idaho College with these eloquent words. To be tolerant of intolerance is to become a part of it, end of quote. Our task force for over 43 years has used our energies and resources to um, counter bigotry and prejudice in our area while promoting civil and human rights diversity, inclusion, and social justice, the cornerstone of a democracy. Finally, we send our support to those wonderful women basketball players, their staff, and their universities, and let them know that they are special people, and we wish them the very best in life. And I want to once again emphasize that these few radicals that are in our community who spew hate, you might spew the hate, but if you result in victims, we will try to prosecute you to the full extent of the law if we can find who you are. And also they noted that they actually have a history of prosecuting folks like this. We have a record that is very important uh, in this community. In 1983 was our first case in court when a member of the Aryan Nations threatened a biracial couple in this community. He was prosecuted under a verbal assault law and he was sent to prison. What you might not know, from 1983 until the present time, we have never lost a case in court in Kootenai County. That is a great record. The mayor of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, spoke at the press conference, and he said, uh, Just as I came in the building this morning, Governor Little called, and he wanted to also share with all of you and the press how concerned he was about the actions that these uh, folks did against some really wonderful people who are visiting our community. He's also going to put out a message of no hate. And so I, I very much appreciate that. It's the same reason that you're all here. You want to share that message. 
So on be I do have a prepared statement I'd like to go through. On behalf of the city of Coeur d'Alene and all of its community, and, and community is bigger than a city, I strongly condemn the appalling treatment of the female college athletes who were visiting Coeur d'Alene prior to the beginning of the basketball tournament in Spokane. To the Utah and Irvine universities, we express regret and true sorrow that your student athletes were treated with such disdainful treatment while visiting our city. Coeur d'Alene, as Tony mentioned, has a long history of fighting for and upholding human rights, civil rights, and dignity for all. We continue to be committed to those ideals and we're intolerant of any form of harassment in our community. To the young women who endured racial slurs while visiting, I offer my most sincere apology. We, all of us, stand with you. We embrace you. We celebrate your accomplishments and strongly denounce any malicious treatment towards you. In Coeur d'Alene, we are pledged to continue to work toward positive change. We believe that all should be treated with kindness, dignity, and respect, all. We wish those women much more joy and much more success as they finish their studies and an even greater success beyond graduation. I want to share with you my frustration when I first learned of this incident Saturday. I'm a father and a grandfather, and over the years, when my children hurt or my grandchildren hurt, you can put a Band-Aid on a cut or you just told them. And my biggest challenge was that I couldn't take those beautiful young ladies and hold them and embrace them and make that hurt go away. It should never happen. It's totally unacceptable. And I, I just want to tell those girls how much we love them, that we want to support them, and that that kind of behavior is totally unacceptable in our community. So God bless you all for coming. And I certainly wish those girls the best. And again, to all the press, thank you very much for coming here and helping us share that message. I appreciate it. And the manager of the Coeur d'Alene Resort spoke out as well. One thing to note is that um, this incident did not happen at the Coeur d'Alene Resort, um, but they did speak at the press conference. On behalf of the downtown business community, let me apologize for this terrible situation and incident. I want to apologize to the student athletes, to their staff, and to the host university, Gonzaga. These students had a right to walk downtown free of harassment. Don't let the actions of a few indict all of Coeur d'Alene. We stand united in not tolerating this type of behavior. On the side of every fire truck in the city of Coeur d'Alene are the words city of excellence. We have an excellent task force tasked with educating the community on inclusiveness. We have an excellent mayor, city council, and staff who are willing to stand up against this type of behavior. We have an excellent police chief and department who have been investing time and resources to identify the responsible parties. Coeur d'Alene became an all-American city 30 years ago because of our stand against this. We remain united today. Thank you. And here is what the Coeur d'Alene Chief of Police, Chief White, had to say when he answered reporters' questions. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lee White, W-H-I-T-E. I'm the police chief of the city of Coeur d'Alene. <clears throat> Our police department was contacted at approximately 10 p.m. on the 21st about an incident that had occurred approximately four hours earlier. It was reported that a vehicle drove by and several racial slurs were yelled by the occupants of the vehicles. At the time of the report, we were unable to speak to any of the potential victims of the incident, nor were we able to locate individuals who yelled the racial slurs. The Coeur d'Alene Police Department has an open case in this matter, and detectives are attempting to speak with any victims of this incident, 
But so far, we don't know exactly who that may be. It was initially reported that there was approximately 100 people who were in the vicinity of the incident when it occurred. We are working cooperatively with our partners at the, at the FBI because there are federal statutes that may be appropriately charged based on what actually occurred. He also talked about whether or not Coeur d'Alene police have actually spoken to players on Utah. Once again, until we speak with the victims of this incident, <clears throat> excuse me, and some more uh, witnesses, it's difficult for us to determine which state or federal statutes would be most applicable. Uh, I would like to say also that if you're a victim or a direct witness of this incident, you're encouraged to call the Coeur d'Alene Police Department. I'll give you that number real quick. That number is 208-769-2320. Uh, our detectives are actively seeking video of the incident um, from uh, various sources along uh, the route that the individuals might have taken. And does that answer all your questions? Okay. You mentioned here in your statement that you've got all of your information from a reliable third party. Is that third party in any way affiliated with the team or with the university here in Utah or even using their body? No, they're not. That's a good question, but they had really good information, so we're based on that. And it's obvious what's happening with, with Gonzaga State and others. The incident did take place. Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I have one more. I'm sorry. Uh, so if this happened on the 21st, why is, did it take until now to kind of, like, release all the information and the statements and stuff like that? I mean, why did all this happen sooner? Another great question. Uh, what we have learned a long time ago as an organization, you get all the facts you can. And we have had all these days to work on this, and it was very difficult. And it's already been said, uh, the, uh, as the chief said, uh, Chief White, uh, we have not been able to talk to the victims directly. And so uh, these processes, you want to make sure you have the facts correct. And so we have been working ever since Friday. And it's been a very, very major task to undertake. Just another question. Have you offered a personal, sincere apology, like a phone call to either of the teams that you've been with either of them? I reached out, as soon as I learned of this, the same night, I reached out to the University of Utah, to the president's office. And uh, as of yet, I have not been able to get in touch with anybody. The only person that I've been able to talk to, that they have uh, policemen assigned to each of the different teams. And he called me back, and I shared my concern with him and, and shared my apologies. But quite frankly, I wanted to do it with the team. I, I wanted to do it while they were still here, but they had already moved to Spokane. And I didn't want to be a distraction to their efforts in uh, uh, being a successful team in their tournament. I thought this just builds up more than that, and I thought I ought to leave them alone and, until the coaches or the athletic director decide they want to talk to us. What law was broken? Did you cite a law that was broken? Me? Yes. No, I, I cannot yet. It's under okay. investigation. But it is just verbal, correct? Chief, why? I'm not saying just verbal. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible comment. But that's what we're trying to figure out is what law was broken. There are a number of crimes we're investigating. It was disgusting. But it was a verbal comment. I'm trying to figure out if it was physical assault as well. I'll answer your question. There was a number of crimes that we are investigating currently. Uh, the first one is there's an Idaho statute regarding malicious harassment. Uh, the second one, second one is a, a disorderly conduct statute. And then thirdly, there is a federal crime based on what actually occurred that evening that might be appropriate. Once again, until we get uh, all the facts and the investigation is complete, what charge might actually be uh, brought against the perpetrators is yet to be determined. And that was the press conference. Uh, it did abruptly end after this happened. Uh, hold, hold on, hold on. We're, 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 we're taking, this is a question for the press. This, this is, is a, a press conference. This press conference with the media, not with the general public. Well, who are you with? Who are you with? It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. You're out of order. Uh, okay. Now, let me say this. Uh, we're going to bring this press conference to a close. Let, let me let me just say this. There is another law called the verbal assault law. This press conference is ended. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Radio. The governor of Idaho, Brad Miller, wasn't at the press conference, but he did release a statement saying, thank you to Coeur d'Alene, 
community for stepping up to reinforce that the city is a welcoming, safe place. Idaho leaders and community members at all levels have been consistent and clear about our values. We fully reject racism in all its forms. There is no place for racism, hate, or bigotry in the great state of Idaho. We condemn bullies who seek to harass and silence others. I will continue the tradition of past Idaho governors in supporting our local leaders in their efforts to eradicate hate and bigotry from our communities. Whenever disgusting incidents like these have occurred in our state, I've seen Idahoans come through every single time to stand up for our shared values, to show respect, love, and compassion for others. Idahoans are good people. And we must not allow hateful, unacceptable actions of a few tarnish our state. All right, guys, that is all that we know right now. I did just want to let you all know what was going on. In general, I don't really like to cover negative topics related to women's basketball, but I did think that this warranted a video. So I hope that this was informative. And I thank the Patreon folks uh, who are supporting this channel. Until next time, guys. Bye.